maybe you can sit Hello. Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the session about carbon pricing food systems. Um, if is, is this a great opportunity or has it many problems? Um, so welcome to uh, all of you, also the online viewers. My name is uh, Jerome Remmers, uh, director and founder of the True Animal Protein Price Coalition. Um, and we have two other panelists here. They will introduce themselves later after my short uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so today uh, we are here at the climate conference in Dubai. And uh, yesterday, maybe you have known that uh, 134 countries signed the uh, 28 uh, declaration on agriculture and climate. Uh, and they announced and pledged to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from food and agriculture. So now, for the first time in the climate conference uh, history, uh, countries really committed to reduce also emissions from agriculture and food, not only from um, from energy. Uh, we have uh, pledged this for a long time already, because one third of all greenhouse gas emissions in the world is from uh, food. And within this amount of greenhouse gas emissions, 60% uh, at global level is from meat and dairy. And in the high income countries, this is even 80%. So there's a really uh, need to, to reduce the emissions from meat and dairy, in, especially in high income countries and China, because there are so much greenhouse gas emissions involved. And the best way, in my opinion, to reduce uh, consumption and production of meat and dairy is give it a higher price because then consumers and producers will react and the polluter pays principle works very well in the energy sector. So why not in the food sector? And you can use tax revenues for many, many very good things. For instance, paying farmers to help them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You can use the revenues also for reducing uh, prices for uh, climate-friendly food products like vegetables, fruits, plant-based meat, plant-based dairy. You can subsidize it. You can give it a zero fat rate. And you can use tax revenues for the new uh, climate and um, climate fund for the loss and damage fund, for instance. So there are many reasons why we could start and consider carbon pricing for uh, food products and agriculture. But the question is where to start and what do we already know about uh, carbon pricing? And uh, are there already examples of how it works? Uh, what can we expect of it? Is it uh, maybe better to start regulation instead of pricing? Uh, are there other options? Um, so that's why, why, where this is all about. So uh, I will start my PowerPoint presentation. Then um, Thomas Lingard, head of uh, global sustainability from Unilever. Thanks really very much for coming here. Uh, he will also react. And uh, then uh, Divertje Wallard, also from the Netherlands, from the youth climate movement will also react. We have a panel discussion and we also invite you uh, afterwards to also be part of the discussion and ask questions or uh, have your opinions uh, also in the debate. Uh, so th this is um, our organization. It's, uh, it's a coalition of 60 organizations, food companies like Beyond uh, Meat, but also catering companies and other companies. Uh, Oatly is a partner. But we have also farmer organizations, environmental groups, uh, health groups, animal welfare groups. They all support the idea of carbon pricing foods, that we have to increase prices for meat and dairy and reduce prices for vegetables and fruits. Um, oh, this is not really very well, but um, <clears throat> this, I wanted to start uh, with the case of uh, uh, the European uh, um, report uh, commissioned by the um, European Commission, uh, DG Agri, the climate department, uh, just two weeks ago. This is a report um, 
yeah, here I see it. This is a report uh, called Pricing Agriculture Emissions and Rewarding Climate Action in the Agri-Food Value Chain. Um, this is, I think, an important report uh, because it explores how an ETS system at the EU level could look like for this sector. Um, as you may know, uh, in the EU, there are ETS, uh, so emission trading schemes, so pricing schemes um, for all sectors except agriculture and food. So I think it's, it's really time that also this sector becomes part of uh, this uh, system because uh, in the uh, other sectors like industry and energy, it showed that uh, emissions from those sectors are reduced by 30%. Because CO2 prices um, increased. So now you pay 100 euros per ton CO2, and then uh, producers react on it and they adapt their ways of production, and this reduces CO2. And they have a ceiling for their emissions from the uh, for the sector. So and every year the ceiling of uh, greenhouse gas emissions they are allowed to uh, emit is going down. So the price is going up and, and the ceiling is going down. So finally, in 2050, they are not allowed to emit any CO2 emissions anymore. Uh, and this is what's going, what this kind of ETS system can really bring down those emissions from different sectors. So I think it will also work in the agriculture and food sector. But in the, uh, but in the energy sector, it worked only after 10 years. So in the beginning, uh, there was a lot of uh, protest against it and uh, the system did not work. The prices were so low that it uh, really didn't uh, change. But uh, I think after 10 years, an agriculture food system, ETS system can also reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, 30% in two years time. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, so at this moment, 13% uh, of EU uh, emissions uh, are coming from um, from the uh, agriculture sector. And um, I think it's even more, according to Greenpeace, it's, 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 it's 20%, but it depends on what you calculate, if you also calculate uh, the, the animal feed or not. Um, so the report um, proposes uh, five uh, scenarios for uh, how uh, ETS could work. So one is uh, at farm level, so on farm. So every uh, farmer in Europe has to pay for its greenhouse gas emissions, livestock farmers, arable farmers. Another option is that only uh, the, the animal sector, the livestock sector pays for it. And another sector that's only paid for peatlands because there are a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from peatlands. And there's an uh, other proposal for the upstream um, ETS. This means that um, uh, feed companies and fertilizer companies are part of the ETS and they have to pay for the CO2 price. And the last option is the downstream option. This means that the dairy factories and the slaughterhouses are part of the system. And so they get the ceiling for their emissions and that goes down every year. And so the prices go up when they want to uh, to increase their production, then they have to buy uh, permits and this costs money. And this will make that they will change the way of production and ask the farmers to reduce their emissions or reduce the livestock numbers. So this is what is uh, uh, will happen. Um, yeah, here you can see all the options in the report. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but here on the right side, you see the downstream option and the green color indicates that this is uh, beneficial. So the report itself advises also to, to start there. And uh, there was an inquiry with all stakeholders like farmer groups, environmental organizations, others uh, who, who read the report or the draft report. And it shows that um, the downstream option, which is um, the first one, um, the most support was there. So 43% plus 20%. So 63% of stakeholders support this option. And we are really happy with that because uh, as Step Coalition, we like to see that uh, not the farmers are part of the system. They, they have it very difficult <laughs> already. Uh, low incomes, but uh, the the companies, the food companies, and the, of course also the real comp uh, retail companies, 
have more ability to to react on this issue. Uh, so together with the European farmer organizations, uh, we also they have also this position that the uh, dairy companies and the slaughterhouses could be part of the system. Um, <clears throat> this is another option for carbon pricing food. Uh, there's a big political debate in in Denmark right now and uh, we expect that uh, next summer uh, the, the government will uh, present uh, one or two proposals on carbon pricing uh, we expect that uh, uh, livestock farmers have to pay uh, an amount for the greenhouse gas emissions so a tax um, and of and this will hurt the export position of of denmark for 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 meats for instance um but they think we need to do this because um, the agriculture sector in Denmark is the largest sector uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. So if they do nothing, then they cannot realize their very ambitious climate goals. They want to reduce 70% of CO2 emissions in 2030. So they cannot say, well, we forget about our agriculture sector. So they really want to do something about it. Farmers protest, of course, but they also accept that it's necessary, but they asked why only have we uh, to pay the CO2 emissions? Why not the consumers? So the farmers now ask, let's have a tax on beef and not, and, and then we as farmers have to uh, pay a lower tax. So there's a real debate there on those two topics. And we think both, both actors can uh, pay a, a, a greenhouse gas emission price at the consumers at the supermarket level in the form of a consumer tax and the farmers or the other um, companies in, in the middle chain. Um, but this is uh, so the debate in um, in Denmark. And uh, so the, a few months ago, the Danish finance minister, he also uh, made public that he is uh, really um, uh, looking into a tax on beef because beef is the product with the highest greenhouse gas emissions and uh, so it makes more sense to start there and then you already have uh, reduced 50 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions from meat consumption because one kilogram of beef is emitting seven times more greenhouse gas emissions compared to one kilogram of chicken and three times more compared to uh, uh, pork meat. Um, so there were a lot of uh, reports made how uh, tax on uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in the livestock sector could work in Denmark. For instance, uh, uh, Think Tank Concito. So they gave a lot of advice and they promoted the on-farm all greenhouse gas emission tax. So it's for CO2 at farm level, so the energy use, but also for methane and nitrogen dioxide. So you have to monitor it every year. The farmers have to have a bookkeeping system and it has to be checked. Of course, it's it's quite some complicated, uh, but you need some intelligence there. But uh, also New Zealand um, wanted to implement a similar system in 2025. This now is a, a uh, um, delayed till 2030, but there's another country uh, who's also wanting to do this. Um, yeah, so um, they gave some principles how to do it. Uh, so um, it's important that if you implement it, uh, it's it's announced quickly and implemented quickly. Uh, it's phased out in time, so you start with a low uh, tax rate and doing it up every year. Um, so there are a lot of recommendations how to do it. And of course, it should be combined with subsidies and regulations. This is really important. Uh, tax system alone is not uh, not the way, but you also have to uh, to give farmers subsidies and consumers subsidies to, to buy the, the the food products uh, uh, with uh, low emissions. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, there was also a debate about uh, taxing meat. Uh, in 2021, uh, the government uh, made a, a study which is based on uh, our organization's proposals. 
on a true price of meat. So we calculated uh, the environmental cost per kilogram uh, pork, uh, chicken meat and beef. And for each product, there's a, a different tax rate because uh, greenhouse gas emissions are higher for beef. So the tax is also higher, but it's also about nitrogen emissions. You can give it a price per kilogram. It's also about uh, um, particulate matter because this is also pollutant. You can also give it a price and biodiversity loss, you can also give it a price. So totally all those environmental impacts have a price. Uh, somebody somewhere in the future or now pays, uh, has to pay for the damage, of environmental damage, and you can give uh, this uh, price. Um, uh, so prices give the right signal to consumers and producers. And uh, the result of the study was that if you implement a price on meat, meat prices would go up uh, with... Um, 40% on average in the Netherlands uh, in 2030, but the, the, the uh, impact on the climate is really positive. It would reduce emissions with two megaton uh, uh, CO2 equivalents uh, per year, which is quite a lot. And it um, and the net revenue is uh, almost 2 billion euros. But with this revenue, you can do so many good things, as I told you can pay the farmers to reduce emissions. So maybe then you have four megaton CO2 emissions because with the money uh, given to farmers, they can do a lot of uh, reductions. Um, uh, this year, there were also negotiations between the, the government and farmer organizations about a, uh, an agriculture ag agreement. It was not signed finally, unfortunately, but there it also in the draft, the last draft, uh, there was also a meat tax mentioned as a way to finance the money needed by farmers to earn money by having agriculture and nature um, production by having climate measures for instance in peat soils reducing the water level but they can have less um, uh, dairy uh, uh, cows uh, so you have to compensate them for them so this costs a lot of money like 600 million euros per year that was promised to the farmers then you can have a, a good uh, way of living while reducing uh, the number of livestock and earning money with nature production and, and water management so but uh, there was uh, nearly this agreement uh, but our government fell afterwards and then now we have a new government unfortunately which maybe it's not willing to do this, but uh, we still have hope for the future. So the conclusion is that uh, different reports uh, say uh, climate uh, taxes in the agriculture and food sector are really necessary to realize uh, climate goals, because the last 10 years, there was no reduction at all in Europe at, in the agriculture sector, even when there were subsidies for farmers to, to have environmental and climate measures. but it still was the same. So that didn't work. So we need taxes now uh, and ETS systems that emissions finally go down. Um, there are some relevant difficulties, as I told, uh, monitoring of these emissions at farm level is really complicated. So maybe you can better do it at a higher level for the meat and dairy companies or the supermarkets. And uh, most stakeholders uh, in Europe uh, prefer the downstream ETS option. So this is... Uh, the state of play now. So there are a lot of uh, uh, proposals made also in Germany. The G German uh, Minister of Agriculture, uh, he's uh, from the Greens, but also from, uh, the last uh, uh, agriculture minister uh, from the Christian Democrats wanted to have a uh, tax on beef, uh, meat, uh, dairy, and eggs to pay farmers to improve animal welfare. So it's not uh, a taboo topic anymore in Europe. And um, now I want to give uh, the floor to uh, to Thomas to, to give uh, first reactions and see if this uh, kind of uh, pricing schemes uh, can be a very promising uh, element in the climate uh, debate um, in this sector. The floor is yours, uh, Thomas. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can both, uh, yeah. And... Um, Maybe first you can introduce yourself and then you too, and then we start. To... So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the afternoon now, so yeah, everyone loses track of the day and the time at COP. Uh, my name is Thomas. I'm the Head of Sustainability for Environment at Unilever. 
uh, we're a global consumer goods company and we've got a reasonably large foods business. Um, uh, well, okay, let's do introductions and then we'll come into it. Hi guys, uh, my name is Diver Trevallert. I am a chairperson at the Dutch Youth Climate Coalition. We represent youth voices in the Netherlands on climate issues, uh, mainly with a political focus. So I'm bringing that youth perspective into this discussion and also trying to note some side notes uh, with ETS trading system and the application of that on systemic change. Is this microphone now going to work? Um, okay, um, and uh, yeah, we know each other already because we were with the agriculture minister meetings and asking him to implement his uh, tax on meat to, to benefit farmers. He's also a partner with uh, the climate movement of uh, Tap Coalition. Um, Thomas, can I give you the floor first? Yeah, to, uh... absolutely. And I think this is now working. Yeah. So um, I'm probably the worst person in the world to have uh, on this panel because I don't know very much about the subject. But we, we got in contact earlier this year and um, I was sort of fascinated by this idea because Unilever was a founding member uh, of the Co uh, Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. It's convened by the World Bank. We've been in lots of meetings uh, with them and engagements with government on carbon pricing. Uh, and it struck me as kind of fascinating that never had the concept of applying this to the food system when it's such a big chunk of global emissions. Um, so I've brought to this panel lots of questions and lots of thoughts, but no real answers. And I'm, I figured that if we organized a session here at COP on this, the room would fill with people who had opinions uh, and interesting thoughts that we had not thought of. So uh, you're all actually panelists here. You, it's a dis disclosure warning, and we're going to come to you for some, some thoughts in the discussion. But I'll give you my immediate reaction. So initially I go, this looks like a very good idea because, uh, you know, we, we know emissions pricing is incredibly effective as a lever. We've seen what it's doing and where it's been applied uh, on, on the energy sector. So why wouldn't you have it here? And then on the other hand, we're thinking, well, you know, you can read your energy emissions pretty much off a meter. Uh, that's pretty easy. So your measurement challenges are going to be much more complicated here. Uh, your social impacts uh possibly in certain contexts of what this might do to food prices uh which could come in in quite a you know, abrupt way could be could be damaging and we'd need to think about how to deal with that and also we're not only managing a climate crisis but we're managing uh, a biodiversity crisis too and as soon as you get simplistic single indicator um uh drivers within regulatory schemes people optimize for that outcome and what do you do a situation where you're actually you know, doing more harm on biodiversity or water or something else because you're purely optimizing for the carbon within an agricultural system. So we've got lots of questions, um, um, but it seems to us like this was a definitely a subject that should be at least on the agenda, if only to quickly discuss it and get rid of it and say, okay, this is going to be too complicated and doesn't work, or to say, how how would it work? In what context would this be by an, and a useful tool? And you leave us very keen to be a part of that conversation. Without any at this point, any particular position or or uh, or decision on the way forward. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas, uh, for your first uh, remarks, and um, we can discuss this uh, pros and cons uh, about this uh, proposal. Yes. So for me, I'm I'm coming at this um, from a little bit of a dis different perspective. Uh, we, with the youth climate movement, we write the youth climate agenda, and it's a vision document in which we try to present the way we envision our sustainable future. Uh, one of the chapters in this agenda is on food and agriculture and the way we eat and the way we produce our food in our future. And the way we approach this is very systemic. So we are all about systemic change um, and we do support uh, true pricing. It's actually one of the key like examples we do see of systemic change being implemented. And this is a, an example of true pricing, uh, especially like I'm not an economist. I'm not as knowledgeable uh, on this topic as Jerome or maybe even Thomas is. But um, I do see like there are certain proposals on uh, implementing the system that do address that systemic change, especially uh, addressing downstream um, producers um, and making sure the, most of the economic impact ends up with uh, the slaughterhouses and the diary industry. 
Um, but on the other hand, I do see like this is just a piece of a puzzle because um, food systems are one of our like basic priorities. They are the basis of our lives, which means if we have to change our behavior surrounding food, we have to not only change our market mechanisms and we not, not only have to change the price of food we pay and we pay for, we also have to change the way we eat. And you can't destroy one system without rebuilding the new system. So I think this is a piece of a puzzle and you have to have a bigger conversation about the food transition. And if we stop eating meat, if meat becomes more expensive, what will be the other side of that story? What are we going to be eating? Uh, so it's like a part of the discourse on the um, protein transition that we're talking about here. And I do think that needs to be mentioned when speaking on uh, these different uh, difficult economic procedures. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree fully with uh, with you, and uh, I know the concerns of, of course, uh, the, the, that relate to this kind of uh, tax taxation proposals. And the first reaction, also from politicians, is meat will become more expensive, but people don't like that, uh, so they don't vote on my party anymore. So this is a real problem for implementing those kinds of proposals. So. When you start of thinking uh, this kind of uh, proposals, you have to think about the yeah the whole system and that some food products will become cheaper, but meat will become a little bit more expensive. But it, on average, food can become cheaper. When you make a lot of food products uh, cheaper, not only uh, vegetables and fruits, but maybe also other food products with a low climate footprint, like bread and cereals and maybe water or tea or whatever, and or, or organic products without taxes, make it cheap or subsidize it with 20%. Why not? We do it with electric cars. We do it with other uh, energy saving options. So we can subsidize those kinds of food products and tax the other uh, products like meat. And then the balance for the, for the consumer is that when they go shopping, they pay less for food products. So this is an option that, that so, we also promote uh, in the, at political level to get this accepted. I think that's like a really interesting point you have there because uh, when we talk about like emission trading systems, it's really far away from the people. And we have to talk about the story that we're telling with this um, because people don't know if you implement these kinds of measurements, people don't know what you're talking about. They only see my meat is getting more expensive. So you have to think about what story do we want to put out into society about these transitions and make sure that like that societal change goes hand in hand with economic change. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I fully agree. And we also um, commissioned a lot of uh, consumer surveys to check if our policies are supported or uh, policy proposals are supported by a majority of consumers, yes or no. And uh, we did it for three years now, and uh, we all uh, we did it all in the Netherlands, but also in Germany and France. And we found that the majority, it's of about fifty-five to sixty percent of consumers uh, in those three countries, uh, supported a tax on meat, uh, with the condition that uh, vegetables and fruits will become cheaper, farmers will get paid more subsidies and low-income groups are, are financially compensated so that also they can afford to buy meat and it's not only for the rich people. So on these conditions, then they say, let's do it. But still, the political parties are still a bit skeptical about it and they know the results of those uh, consumer surveys. And uh, uh, But uh, I hope in future they have the courage to, uh, to start it like Denmark now is doing. Mm -hmm. Can I ask? Can I ask you some of the on the, some of the challenges that are raised about sort of not only focusing on carbon but also biodiversity? Do you think it's possible to optimize systems, you know, under a framework like this that that also recognizes other co-benefits of different farming processes? Yes, I think it's it's very good possible to uh, to to have this uh, nature uh, biodiversity benefits. Uh, first of all, we have to consider that uh, meat and dairy cause global level, 80% of biodiversity loss, according to FAO and, and other institutes, 80%. So all the deforestation in the world is mostly caused by the increased consumption of meat in the world. 20 years ago, 
uh, the, the world consumption of meat was the half of what it was now. So it's growing so fast. So, um, and uh, because for meat, you need a lot of animal feed. And where is this produced? On land where there were, there were trees. So it's not everywhere. It's going on. It's also in the Amazon, it's still continuing. Um, and on the other hand, when you have a tax on meat, that, that was the debate in the Netherlands, that farmers want to produce more nature on their area to protect uh, the animals and uh, live there. And uh, uh, it's, this costs a lot of money for the farmers. They, they, they need uh, half of their income from subsidies for, for nature production because you can produce milk or dairy or you can produce nature you can but then it should be paid by someone and the government can step in and use the tax revenues from a tax on on, on uh, dairy products or uh, meat products to pay farmers to to produce nature and to to protect water etc so this is the debate about the ecosystem services that we have to if we as a society want a clean environment then we have to pay for it can i that's because it's almost a question, maybe, because I see you in this panel as like a business representative. Um, Jerome says someone's going to have to pay for it. And some of the proposals here, they also suggest like the industry is going to pay for it. Businesses are going to pay for it. They are going to be the ones who are suffering these tax raises. How do you look at that? Or do you see the potential in this system? Well, I think when it, whenever you choose to price something within a system, at the end of the day, you know, the consumer pays for it. Um, you know, either prices go up, people pay more, or you uh, you raise a tax and therefore the government has another source of revenue and it distributes. So, you know, as a society, we should be not so worried about the application of taxes, but how that how that falls, you know, how that lands in, uh, in, in a socially just way. Um, and, you know, we have previously lobbied for taxes, uh, for example, on uh, even on, Things like uh, landfill and so on, where we, you know, we were like, well, we need a tax on landfill to make the recycling, you know, more more commercially competitive. And that's what we want everyone to be doing. Um, if you go back twenty years, so we've got, you know, by form on lobbying for taxes, even though we might end up paying them on the grounds that it steers society in the right direction. Um, so it's more about where's the best place if you want to drive a change. Where's the best place to intervene in that system for the right kind of outcomes with the minimum unintended consequences. Um, and I think, you know, we'll up for a, a grown up conversation on the, the right way to do that. Um, you know, this, with, with the carbon pricing and ag, it's kind of how, how much complexity can it, can you cope with how much nuance in those systems? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the, the, I mean, we're not, we're not it really in the, in the meat industry in any sort of significant way, but we, we have got a long history of working on crops that are sort of high deforestation risk and this point on the fact that a lot of, um, yeah, you know, a lot of the footprint from, uh, from meat and dairy is coming from soy, which you know maybe you know linked to linked to deforestation is a another interesting angle that actually I, I was not thinking so much about, but you would pick up as well as the kind of meat and dairy sort of uh, emissions from the animals. You've got the value chain emissions that could, could be priced in, provided you've got good enough data on the mm -hmm. the origins of the soy and the footprint, with including any deforestation related emissions. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, should we open, should we open yes, it out? I'm sure I think... people in the room with yes. thoughts and okay. yeah. Is there any observations? Question or nobody? Martin? Yeah. Oh. Okay, can you get, come here and have the mic? Okay. Um, yeah. Let's. Everyone understands. It's that's. This is enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm very interested in the policy at the moment of Unilever. You are. You are from uh, that multinational. Eh? At the moment, uh, could you tell some uh, something more about the actual policy uh, related to this, this subject? So how uh, does Unilever want to continue with this uh, this goal from from top? So uh, thank you for the question. I mean, I've, I said at the beginning, we have not yet got a hard position on this. We've been very supportive of carbon pricing in general as a lever um, because we know that's incredibly 
uh, effective in, in driving emissions reductions in systems. We've not, uh, honestly, until we had the conversation a few months ago, even considered this idea of um, emissions pricing as the lever in agriculture. But we have got very ambitious science-based targets. We're trying to reduce our scope three sort of end-to-end -end value chain footprint in line with the Paris Agreement. And that requires deep cuts right across every sector, including in the agricultural sector. So we're very interested in any policy intervention uh, that might support that. We're, we're part of... Um, uh, other initiatives here at COP uh, on on sort of regenerative food systems and shifting policies uh, and subsidies that might support that. Um, so yes, we've come here with a very open mind about you know is this something that uh, that could be a another uh, sort of weapon in the arsenal to help drive down emissions. You're welcome to join the TEP coalition if you have your position <laughs> ready. Thanks for this. Do we have another question here? Shall we? Yeah. So let me say uh, I'm hardwired in here. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is around how we, and, and I'm just curious to understand if anyone's already looked at this really, how we can design um, some sort of pricing intervention doesn't then, to Thomas's point, lead to unintended consequences for nature restoration, um, but also for nutrition. So my understanding is that a lot of data that's being collected that could be used to inform something like a, a climate or carbon tax focuses on product footprints. So we could theoretically see an unintended consequence where actually consumers are shifting to more chicken, more processed meats, uh, and the diet becomes unhealthier. And a lot of those foods are actually associated with higher deforestation risk as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just curious to hear thoughts. Yeah. Or from anyone else in the room, for that matter, uh, on that. Shall I give a first uh, reply? Um, um, CE Delft Consultancy um, made a report. Uh, we paid them for it to, to make the calculations of what would happen if a tax on the beef, uh, chicken and, and meat would be implemented. So for chicken meat, uh, the tax is the lowest and for beef, it's highest. But they calculated the effects uh, based on uh, price elasticity calculations. And they uh, saw that, of course, the beef consumption is reduced most by 60%, but also the chicken meat consumption is reduced by 30%. So it's not that as a result of this kind of taxation, people eat more chicken meat. A lot of animal welfare uh, organizations are really afraid that this happens because there's a lot of suffering in, in, in chicken uh, farms, of course. Uh, but we expect that this will not happen. And of course, you can also choose a flat tax that all meat products will have the same price. But we think it's better for health and for climate that, that red meat and processed meat has the highest tax rate. Because uh, in, in, in Western countries, uh, people eat uh, overeat meat, and this is causing a lot of uh, harm and health uh, consequences for heart diseases, diabetes 2, and cancer. And uh, we all pay a lot of our the money we earn to, for health costs. I think it's maybe 20% of our, uh, what, we, what we earn. And this is arising because we eat too much meat, not enough vegetables and fruits, and too much sugar. So it's also it's benefiting us if we tax meat, but we have to understand how it works. And in the same way, uh, we can reduce our spendings on climate measures because taxing meat is the cheapest climate option. Because you you only have to you you have to eat anyway. So if you eat uh, uh, plant based proteins, well, this costs not much more money, but but they're really, really expensive climate measures. They they cost the, the the society a lot of money. So if you invest more in reducing meat consumption, this is the most uh, cheapest option, uh, and we can save a lot of money as a society if, if we would tax meat. Then we can uh, keep the very expensive climate measures in the energy and industry sectors. This this was also. The result of a report from our uh, um, PBL, this is the Institute for uh, Climate Research. They, uh, it was a long time ago, but they said they, uh, climate goals in 2050 will be 50% um, cheaper when there's a tax on meat in, in the high income countries. 
So it really makes a, a lot of difference also in terms of uh, finance and climate finance. Can I also ask you a question? Yeah. Um, we are coming at this right now from a very much a Global North perspective. We are a Global North panel and um, your um, proposal also states only introducing this in Global North countries, like in Europe. Yeah. Um, but how would uh, will this affect like Global South industries like land use and uh, food production there? And is there any research on the economic effects it will have on other parts of the world? Yes, of course, there there will be changes. So it uh, it will it can affect producers in, for instance, Br Brazil and Argentina. They produce a lot of soy and a lot of meat. It's exported to everywhere in the world. And when uh, Europe or America and China are eating less meat, of course, then they can export less. So they have to change maybe the, uh, what they produce. But to be honest, uh, a lot of people in the world want to eat more meat. So uh, low-income countries, it's even beneficial for health to eat more uh, meat products or dairy products because they eat they have not enough proteins in their diets. So I think it's fair that uh, some countries increase their meat consumption till certain levels, not too much, of course, but there's so much overconsumption in, 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 in America, China, OCD countries. So we hope that this is a fair balance that um, the, the rich countries admit that they have to reduce this kind of consumption to make way for other countries to eat a little bit more and then together realize the climate goals and the biodiversity goals. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I'm Proskovia from Uganda. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the, the organizers of this to include the youth. Because I've been going different uh, forums and we're not getting the youth on the panel. So congratulations, whoever money should have her in. I'm glad she's in and she's raised something I was already asking. However, I just want to add on what she said, because as we come up to COP, it's a global discussion, but also need to be aware that the global south, for example, the Africa where I come from, we are almost clocking 2 billion in the population. So in your calculation, and solution, if you're not addressing what Africa needs, you're already eliminating 2 billion people in the next future. Now, the discussion is, and this goes to my friend Tom, is Unilever seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, you seem to have two different measures, the global north and then the global south. And some of the accusations, and I'll just say allegedly, is that some of what we consume at the Global South is not actually supposed to be consumed. Now, I'm, I'm just saying allegedly. So how do we bridge that misinformation? How do we get the right data in place so that we can, from the Global South or any other person or the youth who are asking the right questions, are brought to this discussion so that we find actual solutions that are workable, both for the North yes. and the South. Then the other elephant in the room, we need to also have the actual data. Apart from saying 90% are the youth, and we break down those numbers so that I can speak to somebody who is faced with climate change challenges at the grassroots. So I need us to unpack that. Thank you. Thomas, can you give a first? Yeah, could I ask you to just say a little bit more about the the two, the suggestion of a kind of a double standard or something? And I I didn't really understand. It's the the double standard is that it's a grade of when you liver is is doing business or the products are aimed at in global north with a different standard and a set of values. When it comes to global south the standards can go out of the window and anything goes. So that is what I was referring to. And I said it's allegedly, so I don't know. And I want, I was asking from you, can you elaborate more whether we have one common standard for Unilever in operations 
or is as allegedly that there are different standards? Well, I have to say that is a new a new one for me. Um, I mean, we I can I can tell you that we operate in line with obviously local regulations and standards are different around the world, and we always comply with the local regulations. There are obviously going to be differences in in product portfolio, in recipes according to local taste and so on. But I'm not aware of uh, it's it's if you're speaking to sort of foods and recipes and so on, that's that's less my area. But um, I'm very happy to follow up with you on that if uh, if that's something of interest. Um, something maybe that's um, adjacent. Um, what well, something we think is important everywhere is the transition to regenerative agriculture. Uh, and actually, we're less, as I said before, we're less actually in them sort of uh, meat supply chains. But one of the things we've been thinking on and how we deliver on our nature targets and our climate targets is to uh, think about what it would take to scale up regenerative agricultural practices, even in, in pure plant-based agriculture. Um, and one of the reasons this question is interesting for us is, you know, many of the, the the agricultural practices you might want to support farmers to introduce, which might sequester some carbon or reduce emissions by reducing um, farm inputs, you know, have this carbon benefit. And how can you, you know, might this be a, a source of income actually for farmers who are sort of pioneering the way in lower carbon agriculture? Um, and we know that regenerative agriculture has a carbon benefit, but it also has many other benefits in terms of resilience, um, in, in terms of, um, you know, the other biodiversity benefits and so on. Um, so, yeah, so one of the reasons we're in this conversation is much more about, you know, is is this a lever for for mainstreaming regenerative agriculture, which I think would be as as much a benefit in, in the global south as the global north. Um, maybe I can also react uh, on um, the, 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 uh, the, the EU report on e ETS emissions that was planned to generate uh, revenues because uh, there's a C2 price and somebody has to pay it. But um, the idea is that the budget is used to pay farmers to apply carbon farming methods and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the reason why also the agriculture department of the EU Commission is happy with this idea because then they can also reward farmers. So it's, some of them have to pay, but others will benefit uh, from it. And um, yeah, for, for, from the South perspective, I I, I really hope that uh, this kind of taxation will also be used to climate finance, finance for loss and damage funds, for instance, or the Green Global Fund, that this money is from the rich countries going to, to countries where, uh, sorry? For the loss and damage fund, when OECD countries and China have just a tax on meat, just one euro or one dollar per kilogram meat, so 10 euro cents per 100 gram meat, what you buy in the supermarket, just 10 cents, it, it, it will generate nearly 150 billion euros per year, which could be used for the loss and damage uh, fund. I actually have two questions, one uh, to Jerome and one to Thomas. Uh, first to Jerome, um, behind you on the screen is a climate tax is necessary. When people don't eat meat anymore, um, they have to eat, start eating more of other things. We all know that things like soy, avocados also have a big climate impact. Um, why specifically a uh, meat tax and not like a climate tax on food in general? That's my first question to you. And then to Thomas. Um, I've read about Unilever, uh, its goal to have like a de deforestation free supply chain in 2023. I was curious to know if uh, that goal has been achieved uh, or if there's still work to be done. And if so, uh, how fast can it be done? So to answer your first question, why tax on meat and not on food in general? Um, in, in countries like European countries in America, 80% of greenhouse gas emission from food is from meat and dairy. So if you focus on those uh, big two products, then you have made the, the best choice. But of course, you can also make a, a, a tax on every food products. For instance, now we are in negotiating with uh, our, our farmers organization and the Dutch Rabobank about a proposal for uh, increasing the existing CO2 tax for the industry in the Netherlands to increase this to the retail industry and the catering 
so their greenhouse gas emissions from uh, food they sell, they can also be part of the CO2 greenhouse gas emission tax. And this is now, uh, I think, 125 euros per ton. So this means that supermarkets have to pay also similar taxes like other kinds of industries. That, it, that's an option. But then supermarkets will soon find out that meat and dairy causes most of the, the tax revenue. So, so they will respond and sell less meat because then they avoid to pay the tax. So you can do it both ways, but some form of tax has to be implemented. And if I can, yeah, if I can answer the question of deforestation, I think we'll be able, if I can just finish this one before we go, we'll be asked to finish up. Um, so yes, absolutely, we've got a target to be deforestation free in our big five commodities: palm, the deforestation from palm, soy, uh, tea, paper and board, and cocoa uh, by 2025, uh, 2023. Sorry. And uh, yes, yeah, so we will publish the results of that tracking in the annual report and accounts, which come out early next year. Um, the work's been going really well. I'm not I'm able to do a spoiler, you know, uh, advance announcement, but it has been going really well. It's it's one of the most um, challenging value chains, uh, particularly in Palm. Uh, it's such a complex value chain, and it, one of the one of the reasons it's taken as longer than we wanted to um, has really been our insistence on keeping smallholder farmers within the value chain. It's very easy when you want to, if you well, it's easier if you want to get the assurances and the paperwork supporting the deforestation-free claims to work with the very large suppliers of the very large plantations and so on, because they find it much easier to comply with the kind of um, requirements that we have in traceability and so on. We felt it been super important, and this comes back to the whole sort of concept of just transition. That if you if you just go the easy route and say, well, we'll just buy from these two big companies and we'll say goodbye to the you know half a million smallholder farmers that are supplying in other parts of the world, that you just you know you shift that demand elsewhere, you remove any incentive and support for those farmers to to get the training and support they need. So we've been trying to move the whole system along um, and keeping those guys in uh, those guys in play, and we felt that's been a really important part of our approach. So even 2023 feels like too late to me and. Lots of other people that work on this agenda, but we've been trying to do uh, the work we're doing in a really inclusive way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to conclude this uh, session. And uh, also to you, thank you very much for your attention and uh, your very good questions. And of course, Thomas, uh, you for being here and you, Diwertje. I was very happy uh, you were on the panel and um, uh, asked the right questions. And hopefully together in the future, we can build a stronger movement towards carbon pricing in food systems. And uh, thank you. And uh, maybe you can spread the world, the word and uh, help us to make it a reality in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.